So welcome, everybody. It's really my great pleasure to uh, talk to uh, Dr. Walter Longo, uh, who has recently published a book, The Longevity Diet. And it's a pleasure of mine because I've been a big fan of his research, and you've probably read in The Plant Paradox that I definitely uh, reference uh, your work. And so it's great, great to have you here. So what compelled you to write The Longevity Diet? The longevity diet is really uh, the result of, uh, of 25 years of work, uh, starting back in the days with Roy Walford, who was, the, was my mentor. It was, at the time, I think, the leading figure in the world for nutrition and longevity. And he had written some books on the topic, of course. And, um, and I just thought that uh, it was 25 years went by, and, we, uh, and at that time, there was really not much genetics Available. We didn't know what genes controlled aging, what genes prevented diseases, and and uh, and certainly we uh, calorie restriction, which is was the intervention that he was really promoting, which is the chronic reduction of calories, um, did did work very well. It, showed, it, it, it taught us incredible, uh, uh, it gave us incredible findings, but at the same time, it just showed us this is probably not the way to do it. Um, you know, people are not going to be willing to do it. And even the monkeys did not live that lot much longer. Um, so, so there was time to really uh, do it differently. And, and I think that uh, the longevity that I waited until I finished clinical trials. And then I felt that, okay, now uh, we can go out and tell people to do something that uh, is being clinically tested in randomized trials and, and uh, is safe. Uh, of course, you can always... Uh, do additional studies, but uh, um, I felt that uh, it was enough to to uh, to really make a difference. Yeah. So what you know, you and I think uh, probably long term calorie restriction is is not the way to go. And you know, I've I've read all of your mentors' work a, way, a long time ago, and it was actually influenced a lot of my work. Uh, but I I, th I agree with you that you know long term calorie restriction it's not the answer. Most people won't do it. Um, and uh, certainly it, in a way, didn't work out for Dr. Wolford uh, in, in the way he thought it would. But there's lots of mitigating circumstances. So give us a little bit of the background of your studies, first in mice and in people that kind of led you to your current thinking. Yeah, so the, the original studies were mostly uh, genetics. And so uh, the fir first was the, uh, the identification of, uh, um, of the TOR, uh, SIS A signaling pathway, uh, and showing that how if you mutated that, that you would get extraordinary effects on lifespan and also on protection. Uh, then we went on to um, show uh, this was what we call the protein uh, aging pathway, so response to uh, high levels of amino acids. And, uh, and proteins. And, uh, and then we identified the, the PKA, RAS PKA in yeast, and PKA probably only in mammals, uh, the response to sugar. So if you have lots of sugar, uh, these, these genes are turned on. And so we think that the protein pathway and the sugar pathway together, they're really pushing systems to uh, age more uh, quickly. And, um, and um, the master regulator or one of the master regulators in mammals and humans, we think is the growth hormone, uh, growth hormone receptor axis, um, meaning that the set of genes that are controlled by growth hormone. And, um, and eventually we were able to start studying this population in Ecuador that is uh, lacking the growth hormone receptor. So they're about three and a half feet tall. And, um, and just like mice that uh, lack the same receptor are long lived, uh, protected from cancer, protected from diabetes, um, and protected from age-dependent cognitive decline, we show that these people probably are just a little bit longer lived, not, not uh, big effects, but pro very much protected from cancer, from diabetes. And the latest paper we show uh, with you doing uh, fMRIs here uh, in Los Angeles, um, that they, they seem to be uh, protected. They seem to have a, a, a younger cognitive profile. So the, the type of um, learning and memory abilities that you see in, in somebody that is younger. Yeah, that's fantastic. 
Uh, yeah, I got interested in TOR many years ago as a, as a transplant immunologist and surgeon, and we were actually researching rapamycin. And uh, became fascinated back in those days, you had actually had to have you know, animal studies that showed how lethal it was. And you know, lo and behold, everybody's surprise, or rapamycin, and given in the proper doses, these animals were living an incredibly long time. So that's, uh, that's my background in that. But uh, we both really kind of focus on two things that w the average person can take home with them. And that is that sugars are bad for the aging pathway. And unfortunately, certain amino acids that are more prevalent in animal protein than they are in plant proteins, this is kind of the one-two punch. And I grew up in Omaha, Nebraska, in the center of the United States, and a meat capital of, you know, of America. And so when people say, well, gosh, you know, I, I really don't want to give up my meats and animal proteins, and I really don't want to give up my sugars, can you, can you say why you think both of those things are probably equal in, equal in importance in producing longevity? In, accel in, uh, in uh, accelerating aging, yeah. yes. In accelerating aging, um, I, I probably think that it's uh, it has to do with reproduction and growth, right? So, so to grow, uh, you need fairly high levels of both, and to reproduce, you need high levels of both, and and you cannot have a baby. It wouldn't make any sense to have a baby uh, if you did not have sufficient, uh, or also because evolutionarily, that would be an enormous investment of energy wasted. Uh, so I think that's probably where the, all of this comes from. Uh, you need enough protein, enough protein reserves, enough sugar, enough sugar reserves, um, and um, to to face you know the nine months uh, to to have a, a baby. Um, but uh, of course, you do it at the sacrifice. Not of course, but uh, probably because uh, there is just not enough. Uh, uh, energy to go around for everything and, and also it wouldn't make sense that you have put so much energy into not aging at all there is probably no benefit uh, of uh, keeping somebody not aging or at least we haven't gotten there yet and so i think it makes perfect sense that now you sacrifice uh, repair and protection for the sake of growth and reproduction uh, and this is pretty consistent uh, in, in many different organisms and uh um, I think it's a pretty good, uh, it, it's very clear, you know, in, in, in a cell, and uh, we've done a lot of work, for example, with chemotherapy resistance, and you see it very clearly, if you push the cell, if you starve a system, and you reduce the glucose and the proteins, um, it becomes protected, but it doesn't divide. It sits there, it's, it becomes smaller usually in size, and, and it doesn't divide. As soon as it, you give them the, the amino acids and the sugar, it, it, it becomes larger, and it starts dividing, and it can divide very rapidly, like like uh, cancer cells. Uh, but when they divide very rapidly, uh, they're very much unprotected, very sensitive. Yeah. So that that brings us actually to uh, a, a good point. Uh, you and I are, are both fans of fasting. I I know you and Joseph Mercola have uh, talked about this. I think. Um, He's probably more on the Jason Fung side of things that a four or five day water fast is a great idea, maybe once a month. You, on the other hand, have the fasting mimicking diet. So could you kind of talk about the benefits, the drawbacks of, of both of these systems? Well, we started with the water only fasting and uh, we started with cancer patients uh, 10 years ago or more. And I have to say it was a disaster. It was a disaster for compliance. It was a disaster for uh, potential safety issues. And uh, it was a disaster also or certainly problematic for doctors compliance. Um, so doctors really felt that they were exposed and they were doing something they didn't feel comfortable with, and so did the patient. So this is uh, how we started, and then we went to the National Cancer Institute and basically said, this is a problem we have. Uh, what about a uh, diet that mimics fasting? And, um, and uh, I, I, I mean, I think I speak from experience, having done this for so long and, and really talked to thousands and thousands of people and hundreds of doctors 
Um, the fast, the water only fasting seems like a good idea because it's free and you feel like, oh, I want to give it to, for free to everybody. But the, um, when we did that uh, in Europe, for example, it was also a disaster when people were allowed to improvise the fasting mimicking diet because uh, people go home and do all kinds of uh, wrong things. People are not pharmacists. They're not trained to make their own uh, if, uh, you know, drugs or, or, or medical food. And, and of course, you know, whereas, uh, let's say, take 100 people, maybe 90 will be fine at any given cycle. And, and so if you look at it from 30,000 feet, you think, well, no big deal. But if you really get, get down there, you realize how a lot of people will have problems with the water-only fasting and they'll have problems even with improvised diets. Um, and so I basically gave up all the uh, financial benefits from the diets. I don't make a penny out of any of it and never will. Um, but I felt, that, and, and it was the right call, uh, do something that you clinically tested in, in, in patients that doctor, that it's always the same. Now it's over 25,000 people have done it with thousands of doctors, and it was tested in randomized clinical trial. So we really feel very, very positive about the safety. And, uh, and, and also, I have to say, a lot of the funds eventually will go back to research and universities and institutions. So even, you know, buying the kit, is really benefiting the the uh, research and it's a good cause and and I think uh, yeah for all those reasons uh, now water only fasting can be done in a clinic in a specialized clinic you know so uh, the True North for example in Northern California does that absolutely and the Bookinger Clinic uh, will help me clinic in, in Germany is another good one and so if somebody can can go to these clinics and and uh, by by all means that uh, they've shown a lot of very good uh, effects uh, now. When it comes to disease prevention, disease treatment, et cetera, uh, then you have to prove it. And, and and even in those cases, the, the clinical trials uh, have been very few for those uh, diets. We're doing uh, many with the FMD, and so I think uh, you know everybody else gotta um, just do clinical trials and show the results, both mouse work and clinical trial, and then I think it's ready for for recommendation. So for the purpose of people who uh, either haven't read your book yet or haven't read deeply into the plant paradox. Can you can you give us a nutshell of what the fasting mimicking diet does and why uh, you think, and quite frankly, I think that this is a, a really good way to go about things. Yeah. So the the um, the main thing mechanistically, I think, if you look at how it works, is the uh, breaking down. I, I like the analogy of a wood-burning uh, train, an old wood-burning train that cannot, does not have enough fuel to make it to the next train station. So it starts burning the damaged chairs, the damaged walls, and uh, then makes it to the train station. And then, of course, it's lighter, and it can make it there. And now um, it can rebuild, right? It can rebuild the chairs, rebuild the walls. So now you have a, you know, not a completely new train, but certainly a train with new chairs and new, newer walls. And that's what the body does. And, and now we, we, after many papers, we have a pretty good idea that, that this is very consistent. So whether it's the, the liver, the pancreas, the uh, hematopoietic system, the blood system, the nervous system, and, and probably the muscles, um, probably everywhere, the, the, the fasting shrinks system because it's trying to get lighter and it's trying to use either intracellularly by autophagy or cellularly by just destroying cells and saying, I don't need, for example, white blood cells go down or you don't need, if you're starving, you don't need all the white blood cells that you normally have. So you, you slowly get rid of some and you don't need all the muscle that you normally, so day by day, some of the muscle is going to be utilized for fuel. And um, and then in that moment, what we discovered a few years ago was the stem cells are getting activated, and the the, the cell is getting ready also to rebuild. So now in the refeeding moment is when most of the the incredible programs occur, and you see embryonic and developmental uh, 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 genes that are being expressed at fairly high level. Genes like Nanog. And probably even OCT4, although it's been a little bit trickier. So some of the, 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 the genes that are involved in pluripotency, the stem cell ability to make almost anything. And you see them turned down at a very high level. So in that moment, then 
you refeed, you have the amino acids. So the same things that are bad for you before now become essential for you to rebuild IGF-1, TOR, um, and, and PKA, etc. And then you rebuild. And that's what, what I think is really the foundation for a lot of the, the positive effects. So, and I think the interesting thing that you've shown is that this is something that you don't have to uh, mod do a modified fast for every day of the month. You found that, in fact, that people can do this for five days a month or seven days a month and eat normally the rest of the month and act as if they had been restricting calories every day. Is that putting it safely? Yeah, so what we've been saying, uh, what we've been seeing is that the, um, first of all, the diet works by far much, much better in subjects that have lots of problems, right? So, so if you have high cholesterol, high blood pressure, high triglyceride, you know, fasting glucose, or you're pre-diabetic, that's when it works the best. And then um, in the clinical trial, the people return to the normal diet. Uh, and, um, and what we saw was that many, many of the effects were long lived. And so the five day restriction seems to reprogram somewhat. For example, IGF 1, if you look at one week later after uh, the third cycle of the fasting vegan diet, and then you even look at three months later, you still see the IGF 1 being much lower in the people that started with very high IGF 1. Now, the people that started with normal IGF 1, it comes down a little bit and not so much um, long term. And, uh, and so, of course, this is very good news because whereas calorie restriction, chronic calorie restriction, drops everything gradually, including the muscle, the IGF-1, the blood pressure. So it keeps coming down. If you look at the biosphere, too, when, when my boss, Roy Walford, was, was there, after a few months, their blood pressure reached, they started with 110. They were very healthy. And then it reached 85. It was like 85 or 55. You know? So the blood pressure keeps dropping. In our case, we don't see that. So you, you, if you have a high blood pressure, you go back to normal. If you have a low blood pressure, you stay there. And that's really interesting because it tells you there's probably uh, fixing problems rather than just blocking pathways that are involved in, in blood pressure maintenance or, or, or uh, gly glycemic uh, uh, levels. Fantastic. So um, one of the things that you write about in the book is that you spend summers uh, visiting, you know, one of the oldest living villages in Italy. And what, what have you learned by observing these people? And the second part of that is, how do you compare this village to the other blue zones? So maybe one at a time. Yes. So the... Um the time, I mean, uh, Italy, Calabria is one of the, the villages we uh, spend a lot of time um, with. And uh, the other one is, is Sardinia now. I've been spending more time uh, uh, with Gianni Pass and others in, in Seulo and Villa Grande. There are the, these very record, world record uh, towns in Sardinia. And, um, and of course, I know I visited Craig Wilcox uh, in uh, Okinawa. Um, several times, and, and uh, I visited the people in, uh, in Loma Linda um, uh, several times. And I think it's just surprising how similar uh, every, every play, everybody has their own version of this uh, vegan slash so plus some fish or sometimes plus some meat, but very little. And uh, most of them seem to have this in common. Now, an interesting thing in Molochio, in, in Calabria, where I, I really grew up, uh, was that, you know, we published a paper a few years ago showing that if you, if you look at up to age 65, low-protein diet is associated with reduced risk for cancer, reduced the, the, the risk for uh, overall mortality. But as, as after age 65, that sort of turned around, right? And so I started thinking, it could it be that the, these people, whether they're in Okinawa, Loma Linda, or uh, Calabria or Sardinia, they're doing the same, and it turns out, we think, and it's a little bit of speculation, but it's very clear what is happening. They, a lot, lots of times, they either go to a nursing home, let's say in Loma Linda, or they go live with their uh, sons and daughters in Calabria or Sardinia, and they start eating a lot more, right? So, so we, we think that 
because of this co somewhat of a coincidence, right? They do the exact the optimal uh, phase specific diet. So they they under eat up to age 70, 75, and then they slowly start eating better, more. Maybe they eat some meat, uh, etc. So so we start. I mean, at least the, the evidence is now suggesting that maybe that's the best way to go. For example, IGF one is very high up to age 45, 50, 60 even, and then it drops down dramatically in, in somebody who's 85. And so we saw, for example, that people had low protein uh, diet and people that had high protein diet when they were over age 65 did not have any difference in IGF-1. So this would be consistent with the idea that you may not need anymore to be restricted that much. And in fact, you might do, need to do the opposite once you get to age 65. And that's exactly what you see in almost all these groups. Uh, not all of them, but, uh, but many of these very long-lived groups uh, tend to have these uh, two phases of life where um, they, uh, they uh, uh, now start eating more at a certain age just because they're in a place that sort of forces them to eat more. Yeah. And uh, have you had any chance to look at the uh, folks in uh, south of Naples in Acciaroli? Yeah, yeah. I, I went there. I went there a few months ago. I spent... Uh, a few days uh, talking to the the dietitians and the scientists there. Um, they're they're you know in many different places. The data is still not very well uh, developed, so I think they need to do more work in um, in trying to figure out you know how many. There's certainly a lot of centenarians in the Chilento area, and they seem to be at a prevalence that is higher or much higher than many other areas. Is not as high as this little town, but it makes sense. Chilento is a large area, so I think you know there is uh, several scientists that are doing work there, and uh, it's bound to uh, they're bound to come up with some very interesting, uh, very very interesting findings. Yeah, I and you know, and again, the diet is the same. You know, when I interviewed many of the centenarians, you keep hearing the same story: some fish, not very much, and lots of vegetables they could get in the backyard, and um, and uh, sometimes. Uh, they would maybe use meat to make uh, minestrone type, you know, vegetable type soups tastier. And differently from what people think, these people did not have huge dishes of pasta and, and you know, bread. They had some pasta, but even pasta, when you ask them, say, they was expensive. You know? So we rather put green beans and, and, you know, and all kinds of other vegetables and then put a little pasta to make it taste good. But we did not want to do what now everybody in the world does, and it's extremely uh, damaging, uh, is to have these 120 grams of, of starches and, uh, and, uh, um, and nothing else. Yeah, I was very impressed. They, they really, I, I found the same thing. They, they didn't really have pastas and breads like uh, other parts of Italy. Uh, I was also impressed with their use of rosemary, which uh, has fascinated me as a as really an anti-aging brain uh, protective compound. So, uh, well, that's great to hear. So, um, we're kind of running out of time. What are you working on now, and where do you see the future of longevity research going? Well, so now we're doing a lot of work, I mean, many more diseases, and, and so we just published a paper on, on pancreas damage. We damaged the pancreas of, of mice, and then we did the fasting making diet, and we showed that we could reverse the, the lack of insulin production, so essentially reverse both uh, type 1 and type 2 diabetes in mice. Um, so now, and we did the same for, um, for multiple sclerosis in my, mouse models, and, uh, and we started, we have some data on the people, but uh, clinical trials, but now we're we're really systematically going through many clinical trials. We have received funding for type 2 diabetes now, uh, received funding for uh, Alzheimer. We have about five trials for cancer ongoing right now. And, um, and uh, so we're going to do a large one with uh, metabolic syndrome. Uh, yeah, so I think in the next couple of years, uh, we're probably going to have five, six, uh, seven clinical trials published on the use of the fasting making diet. They're not always the same. Some of them are lower calories, some of them are longer, uh, higher calories, some of them are longer, uh, last a week. For example, for autoimmunities, we're gonna uh, test a uh, uh, fasting making diet that are a week long, uh, just to get more effect on, on autoimmune cells, have more killing of autoimmune cells and, and more uh, activation of, of stem cells. So yeah, those, uh, th these are so, some of the things that we're gonna be doing in the next uh, few years. 
All right, great. Well, that's been fantastic. And, you know, I, keep up the good work. Uh, like I say, I've followed you through the years. I followed your mentor. And w we should stay in touch because uh, I love what you're doing. And, and thanks, uh, thanks for spending time with me today. Yeah, uh, thank you. And thanks for the great book you wrote. Yeah. And, and folks, uh, get Dr. Longo's The Longevity Diet. You can, I'm sure, find it at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, or your local bookstore. It, it's a very good read, and he's, he's truly one of the great experts on longevity there is. So uh, listen to this guy, okay?